So generally speaking, we work towards something called the four Fs, where if we've got a legal right to be on land, we can gather foliage, flowers, fungi and fruit um, quite, quite sort of safely and quite, quite legally. I don't believe our ancestors uh, wandered around aimlessly looking for, for things. I think they recognised various ecosystems and habitat types and had a good idea of, of the sorts of wild foods and the sorts of craft materials, um, pretty much everything they needed uh, that would be found in that, those sorts of areas. A lot of wild food poisoning cases happen when people inadvertently gather things and mix them in with something edible. So if you are eating foods, and the key thing is to really pull them apart, throw anything away that's not typical, anything that you're really um, not sure. Even if you think 99% of the time that you are right, you're not starving, it's not worth uh, taking the risk. Most things that, um, that you'll come across will probably just make you ill, but there are a few things out there that, um, that, that really can be very dangerous. With wild foods, um, they have a reputation of being quite bland, which I, I'm not convinced myself. I think it's more to do with the fact that we have everything so full of salt and sugar that we can't taste anything. And this little guy is an edible one. Uh, it's also medicinal, but it's also a flavouring. Now if I'm going to uproot this one, and it's very, very common, so I wouldn't advocate uprooting everything you come across. And certainly if we walk down this track, we'll see lots and lots of these. So it's locally abundant. So again, I don't think we should be taking the, the only one of a species that, we're, that we come across. So this is um, her Bennett, it's also called wood avens, and it's very easy to identify because as the main stem goes up, we get these two little enfolding leaves and then it splits into three, this trifoliate leaf. And that's a, a good way to remember it because um, the herb Bennett comes from um, the Benedictine, which is blessed herb, and this is supposed to uh, represent the Holy Trinity. You can eat the young leaves, but it's the root that's the real um, the real interesting part and this smells very very much of cloves it's good for toothache and it's also good for um, for settling stomachs to some extent so on, on a simplistic level it's um, it's quite important to think about where these plants are going to be found and most of our flowering plants need um, almost direct sunlight so looking at the edges of the rides uh, in a woodland situation um, is going to be a lot more productive than going deep into the shade and deep into the forest where, um, where you don't really, really find anything because it's shaded out. So this one here is, uh, is Pendulous Sedge and there's a little rhyme that goes with identifying these grass-like um, and reed-like um, plants and it starts off that sedges have edges and if you look at this one you can perhaps see that it's triangular, the main stalk coming out is triangular. Um, and rushes around and, and grasses are hollow down to the ground. So that's the little rhyme, which kind of works most of the time, but there, there are exceptions. The name is, um, as opposed to other sedges, it's a lot bigger and it is, as you can see, drooping down, being pendulous. So we get that pendulous sedge. The seeds that we're eating here have been found in Neolithic settlements um, all, all across Europe. And it likes quite damp conditions. Even with our sort of drained agricultural land that surrounds most of our woodlands, you can still find big, big um, acreages of this. Our ancestors had this balance to energy expended in, in gathering a food versus what they would get back from it in, in calorific value. They don't seem to um, suffer from ergot. And ergot's a, a fungus that grows on grasses and contains, which is essentially LSD, and can be very toxic and um, obviously lead to all sorts of unfortunate incidents in the woods. In the female flower here, and this is the male one, which doesn't have any seeds on the one at the top, which was producing the pollen. So we can uh, wait to the autumn, we could take these off now and we could effectively dry fry them to force autumn to come up and you've got a good old carbohydrate and carbohydrate is quite difficult to find in the wild diet in quantity. So if we look at the edge of the ride where the light is obviously penetrating, this is where we're going to get our lush uh, growth and this is where we're going to get all our potential for, for wild foods and medicines. Here we've got uh, common garden nettle which has a, a multitude of uses. Uh, a lot of people, when they think about eating these, they just think about grabbing the leaves and, uh, and going for it. But to be honest, if we start to come down the stems, you can see on this one here, they start to get eaten by all kinds of things. They've got holes in them. My experience, the very best part of the nettle to eat is these lush growing tips at the top here. You can see it's a very, very pale green still. It's nice and succulent. And if you pull out the tips, you can keep coming back to the same patch and harvesting them several times throughout the year. You can start when they're about that big and get them all the way up, up to here. So this is a very, very common plant that you'll find in your lawn. It likes to grow on disturbed ground. It's one of the plants that I think the Europeans took to North America and it fell out of the seed corn 
um, on the on the on the wagon trains and became known um, by the locals as White Man's fit Footprints because it followed that train or that wagon train track. It doesn't mind being stood on, mowed over. I'm sure anybody that's tried to get it out of the lawns will uh, will appreciate that. But it's a very very useful plant in all sorts of ways. It's also useful from a wild food point of view because it's very difficult to get it wrong because it's so so stringy in the leaf. So if I pull this leaf apart, you see as it's got very very stringy fibres in the ribs here, very ropey, and this thing will get huge, and it's an all-round useful plant. Right from the top in the autumn where it, it creates a, um, a, a seed head, and those seeds heads are, are full of a uh, substance called mucilage, which is a carbohydrate, and as we've uh, already discovered, carbohydrates are quite difficult to find. You can eat the leaves, but the leaves are also used to relieve itches and bites and things like that. Um, so chewed up, this is a lot better for nettle sting than uh, dock leaf is. And then going down, further down, this, um, the leaves are also edible by the way, these little roots can also be fried up as a bit of a source of carbohydrate and they go a little bit like uh, crispy noodles. So I don't think anybody would uh, object to you digging those up in terms of conservation either. Another little uh, classic woodland plant here and one of the first ones that many, uh, many, many foragers learn because it looks a little bit like clover and this is, uh, this is wood sorrel has a really gorgeous um, white flower with, with pink streaks in it. Very reminiscent of, um, of apple peel and it's got oxalic acid in there which you can't eat too much of because it, um, it has a bit of a detrimental effect on your, on your kidneys um, in terms of giving you kidney stones. So you wouldn't want to eat, eat a handful of, um, every single day of your life but every, every now and then as an addition to a salad it's great. This time of year, springtime, is obviously um, a bounty in terms of wild foods and then in the summer it can, it can dry up a little bit as, um, as lots of our plants get exhausted with reproduction. Um, autumn we've got our nuts and our berries and our fungi and lots of fruits and then in the winter it can get a little bit um, more difficult to, to find wild foods and I think I'm convinced our ancestors probably stored quite a lot of it. So this one, um, this plant here is a great, great source of carbohydrate. Well, in fact, the whole plant is edible, but the leaves are incredibly bitter, I'd have to say. It's the root that I'm really after. And just like um, preparing your vegetable patch at home, if we don't dig a decent sort of amount of earth out, we're not going to grow carrots, for example, with very good long roots. They're going to be short and stunted. Just as if this soil has been compacted by forestry vehicles going over it, then the root of this may not be the best. And again, Thinking about our, our calorific um, input, this would be a balance, balancing act that our ancestors would have had to do. Um, are we going to expend more energy digging this thing up than we're actually going to get from it? I guess we'll just have to find out. <laughs> There's several um, plants that have these big, big, large, fleshy leaves. Uh, one in particular in this environment you'd have to be aware of would be foxglove. So what, what, a, what a plant like burdock and foxglove are, are, are what we call biennial plants, which means it takes two years for them to finish their life cycle. And in the first year, what these, um, these plants are doing is lying as flat as they can and catching as much sunlight as they can. And then they're storing that in the root, which makes them great to eat. But also um, can also mean that they're confusing because we probably all appreciate foxglove has this huge great flower stalk that's with purple flowers. That's only true in its second year. In its first year it sits very very flat to the ground just like this and we really don't want to be eating foxglove because of the effect that it would have on the heart. And what I've found over the years of looking at these things the most reliable way to tell them apart is to look at the veins. The veins of the burdock as they come off the midrib they travel out and go straight to the edge of the leaf. Fox gloves tend to travel out and then go back up almost parallel to the main rib and I found that to be the most reliable way to tell them. So the root should go straight down but obviously if it hits a stone it may, it may go sideways, it may be really small and stunted and I think this one's going to be small and stunted because we're right on the made up track. But it's, sometimes it's good to go through this process just to illustrate that point. But you can see that this is all chalk brought in to build up the tracks in this, this particular woodland. So we've got a tiny, tiny little root. So it's not particularly impressive, that one. But I guess on the plus side, I uh, didn't spend lots and lots of energy digging it out. We know the burdock's attached to the root. We know we've still got burdock. And what we can perhaps see in here is it has, the, has a fairly fibrous outer rind 
which we tend to get rid of. And that's the bit in the middle that we're after. I think the Japanese slice this up into sort of matchstick, fry it up and then eat it with soy sauce. You can roast it just like you can any root vegetable, but I'll just eat a little bit of this raw. And it tastes like a, a cross between parsnip really and, uh, and potato. So I think part of the, um, the secret with foraging and finding things is to, is to learn to look at the individual patterns and not just see this sea of green. So if we look here, for example, what at first just looks like a mass of vegetation soon reveals, well, bugle, this is a little bit more obvious because it's, uh, it's purple. We've got a young sycamore coming up through here. We've got Herb Robert. We have a strawberry. We have our Herb Bennett. Um, we have Enchanter's Nightshade. So in a little tiny little patch like here, now Yellow Pimpernel, we have five or six different species that superficially, if you just walk past without noticing, um, you, would, you would walk past so many opportunities.